Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining today's briefing on the case for funding UNRWA. My name is Odelia Mader, the Program Associate for Middle East Policy at the Friends Committee on National Legislation, and I will be moderating today's panel. Co-hosting this briefing are our friends at the Office of Representative Andre Carson, as well as Demand Progress and Oxfam. Uh, in our last briefing in this series, we heard from two established professionals who have dedicated their careers to US national security on why an immediate ceasefire was necessary to bring an end to the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza and prevent a full-blown regional war involving the US, Israel, Hezbollah, and Iran. Unfortunately, that briefing is all the more relevant today, so please see the link sent in the chat to hear what our panel panelists had to share uh, just a couple months ago. In just five days, we will mark a year since the war in Gaza began and has severely devastated Palestinians, Israelis, and now Lebanese people. Over two million Palestinians in Gaza face what some are calling the worst man-made humanitarian disaster in the world with levels of famine, the spread of diseases, and continued mass displacement. With the war in Gaza expanding to both the West Bank and now Lebanon, humanitarian needs are on the rise. On September 18th, Representatives Carson Jayapal and Shikowski introduced H.R. 9649, or the UNRWA Funding Emergency Restoration Act. FCNL, along with this briefing's co-hosts and over 100 national organizations, have endorsed this bill, as can be seen in a letter, which will be said shortly in the chat. Um, and the letter was to President Biden calling for the restoration of US funding to UNRWA. The bill also has roughly 70 original co-sponsors, and that was upon its introduction. And just a number of reasons FCNL supports this legislation are that UNRWA provides indispensable and crucial infrastructure to administer humanitarian aid in Gaza, as well as across the Middle East, including in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and the West Bank. Their dedicated employees continue to carry out life-saving work under constant threat and violence. As of July, 158 dependents of staff for UNRWA have been killed in Gaza, and that number has likely grown since. UNRWA has committed to neutrality and implemented all recommendations made by the UN's ongoing investigation into the agency. Their swift response to allegations against a number of their employees, along with the adoption of the UN's recommendations, has led to all other donor countries, including key US allies such as the UK, Germany, France, Japan, and Australia, to restore their funding to the agency. And this legislation seeks to right the wrong of politicizing aid by shutting down US funding to an agency whose work is more crucial now than ever. So in this briefing, we'll take a deeper dive into what UNRWA's work entails in Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon, and the region, the consequences of US funding to suspension to UNRWA, steps UNRWA has taken to ensure transparency and accountability since allegations were made against them, and the findings of an independent review of the organization. After our panelists answer a couple of questions each, we'll proceed to a Q&A section where we'll be addressing questions sent via our registration form. And if you have further questions, please do use the Q&A function in the Zoom, and we'll try to address them if time permits. First, we'll hear from Roland uh, Friedrich, Deputy Director of UNRWA Affairs in the West Bank. Roland has more than 20 years of experience in conflict management, political affairs, peace building, governance, security sector reform, and rule of law and strategic management, with a focus on the Middle East North Africa region. Previous to working at UNRWA, Roland has had a robust career in the peacebuilding sector, including but not limited to serving as senior peacebuilding advisor and director of programs at the International Development Law Organization, chief of analysis at the United Nations Support Mission in Libya, and head of office for the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance in Palestine. Roland has also written extensively on conflict management, peacebuilding, and security sector governance and reform in the Arab region. So first, Roland, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and could you provide us with a brief history of UNRWA and of an overview of UNRWA's operations in Gaza and the West Bank? And if possible, could you also tell us about attacks on UNRWA's facilities in Jerusalem and other ch challenges that UNRWA's operations face today. 
Thank you very much indeed, Odell. It's, it's a great pleasure to be with you all, and, and thanks for this opportunity. For the last uh, three weeks now, I've, I've, I have the honor to, to steer the whole ship here as the director of Uno Affairs in the West Bank, and I'm very honored to, to speak to you today here. I will throw as much information at you as possible in a very short time frame, um, but I think it's, it's a really good opportunity to dig a bit deeper into UNOMA's mandate history and what we do. Perhaps just to remind ourselves, I mean, UNOMA, of course, doesn't work in a vacuum. We have our mandate from the General Assembly. The agency was established in, uh, in 1950, following the GA Resolution 302, adopted in 1949, with a particular mandate to deliver uh, relief works, meaning development support and humanitarian aid to Palestine refugees. I think it's important to note that we say Palestine refugees, not Palestinian refugees. And the reason for that is that UNOWA's definition of a Palestine refugee is not a legal definition. It's a functional definition. Palestine refugee is anybody who lost their home or income due to the 1948 conflict and their recognized dependents. And I'm saying that because until 1952, UNOWA also extended support to Jewish refugees um, that lost their home and income as a result of the conflict and to Palestinians who then resided in the newly established state of Israel. So just to show that this was a functional definition, not a legal definition. That means we don't confer refugee status. It makes us different from UNHCR, which is, is a younger organization. Um, how, how, are we, how are we operating? Um, UNOWA has five field operations, West Bank, Gaza Strip, Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. Um, we have a workforce of about 30,000 staff members in these five uh, uh, fields of operations. And um, we deliver services to refugees in camps and non-camp locations. And what we do is one education, two primary health care, three uh, relief and social services, meaning social protection, four infrastructure and camp improvement, five microfinance, and then six um, protection in the broader sense, you know, when it comes to, to, to you know, human rights protection, addressing gender-based violence so on and so forth. Just to give you a bit of a scale, what we run in the West Bank here is an operation with 4,000 staff members. We run 96 schools um, in, in and outside 19 refugee camps in the West Bank. We run 43 health centers. We have three um, vocational training centers. We also provide um, cash payments to poor refugees, be it those residing in camps, but also Bedouin and Herder uh, communities that are registered refugees in Area C. These are the areas that are outside uh, uh, Palestinian authority, security, or civilian control. We do the sewage management, the solid waste collection of camps. We have a microfinance portfolio of $10 million. So it's a big operation. And the number of registered refugees in the West Bank is roughly 870,000, 230,000 of those live in those refugee camps, but there's also a number of refugees outside those camps who, who receive our services. And I'm saying that because through the contribution that we make here, we not only, of course, allow Palestinian refugees or Palestinian refugees to unfold their human potential, um, you know, in, in teaching, through the services, through the capacity development, but because of the size of the refugee population, because the refugee camps in the West Bank tend to be areas of, of uh, poverty, but also heightened political activity. Through our service, we also make a direct contribution to security and stability in the West Bank. And at the moment, since the, the war uh, started following the terrorist attack by Hamas on Israel on the 7th of October, we see actually an increase in demand for UNOVA services in the West Bank. I'll give you a figure, normally we have 45,000 students every scholastic year in our school. Now with the socioeconomic situation of West Bank dramatically deteriorating, unemployment 30% and the camps more than 50%, we see an increase in students actually coming to our school at a time when the Palestinian Authority, because of the political pressure it's under and because it does lack the funds, is not able to provide normal services. And I think that's something important to, to keep in mind. Um, secondly, we also do with, deal with increased violence in, in the West Bank here that particularly affects refugee populations in the camps in the Northern West Bank, more activity by Palestinian armed actors, heavily militarized Israeli operations, and those affected are, are indeed the refugees residing in those camps. I think what is noteworthy is that when it comes to uh, the political difficulties that we're facing uh, with the government of Israel at the moment, 
Um, we have a very solid relationship with uh, the Israeli ministry in the West Bank, um, who do appreciate our work in maintaining service delivery and thereby contributing to stability in the West Bank as well and beyond, beyond the West Bank. Because clearly whatever happens to the West Bank directly has an impact on stability in Jordan um, and in the neighboring country. So I think that's, that's something important to, to keep in mind. Now, when we talk about the Gaza Strip, of course, it's a different situation. Um, it's it's uh, it's humanitarian catastrophe by all standards that, that we can think of. In Gaza, the number of registered refugees is 1.4 million. Before the war, we used to run more than 180 schools with more than 280,000 kids in school. Now, since the war started, none of those kids are going to school. A lot of the infrastructure there is destroyed. We used to run 22 health facilities on the ground. And clearly, um, we deal with a completely different scenario there now. I am pleased to say that despite all of the, the despite the very difficult kinetic environment in the Gaza Strip, UNOWA is able to, to continue to provide some services. For instance, one is UNOWA is the backbone of the humanitarian operation on the ground. Um, it provides the basic logistical infrastructure for distribution of aid. Until very recently, it used to engage in all the fuel import together with Israel. Um, we, together with WFP, cater for the food supplies. We do half of the 1.9 million Palestine refugees in Gaza. WFP does the other half. We continue to run our health facilities to the extent possible. It's very difficult, but we do have eight health centers in Gaza that are still open. We've got mobile health teams going around supporting people in shelters. And as you know, the situation there is, is really dramatic. You have 1.9 billion, billion people displaced, some of them multiple times. The Northern Gaza Strip is completely cut off from the South, except for limited aid convoys that only with great difficulties with coordination. And you have probably 250, 300,000 Palestinians still in the North, and then the rest of them in a very small area, largely um, the Mawasi, so-called humanitarian zone adjacent to Mediterranean. Um, so that is, is a very challenging situation. Happy to also talk a bit more about the actual difficulties on the ground in terms of introducing aid. But just to say, UNOWA, despite all the difficulties, continue to be there working very closely with other counterparts of the humanitarian um, country team. We do see also now, of course, um, a shift in Lebanon slightly into an emergency mode. We have since the beginning of, of uh, large scale hostilities about sort of 10 days ago, opened some of our schools as shelters, um, where we have now uh, uh, increasing population from the south taking refuge in these installations. Um, and these are basically shelters that are mostly schools in the Bay, Bay, Bay Road area or further north. We had to suspend some operations in areas of uh, kinetic activity, particularly south of Lebanon, particularly health centers there. Um, and there's of course great concern that with all the combustive mix in Lebanon, certain refugees, the internal stability of Lebanon, more, more military operation in the south that clearly will, in our, our anticipation, lead to more beneficiaries coming to demand UNOWA services as well. And I'm saying that because UNOWA has a double mandate. We do, in normal times, the service delivery and the development bit, but now we're increasingly also asked to do uh, direct humanitarian operations, be it clearly in the Gaza Strip, in the Northern West Bank, and also now in, in, in Lebanon. Um, maybe maybe a couple of words on, on what we're dealing with in terms of, of obstacles. Um, there have been, been, been efforts by, by the Israeli authorities um, to, to uh, hamper UNOWA's activity since the 7th of October. And I'm particularly concerned by efforts of the Israeli Knesset to introduce legislation um, to ban UNOWA's work. We've seen on the 22nd of July Knesset adopting three bills in the first reading, one to designate UNOWA as a terrorist organization, second one to strip UNOWA of its privileges and immunities, and the third one to ban UNOWA from operating in East Jerusalem. This is extremely concerning. Uh, if these bills were to be approved, and there are currently efforts to push them ahead in the Knesset, um, and we might see, might see some concerning developments in the coming days and weeks, if these bills were approved, it would be extremely difficult for UNOWA to operate. And that would put in jeopardy both the stability in the West Bank, the rights of all beneficiaries, but also the humanitarian operation in the Gaza Strip. And, and in addition to that, when you look at the content of those proposed laws, they would have would set an extremely concerning precedent for UN operations globally. 
I mean, stripping UN agencies of its PNIs has never happened in the history of the of the of the UN, uh, and it would have a, a grave impact on the multilateral system going forward. You can easily imagine that other other governments might then opt to take similar measures against other UN entities in, in other in other countries. So that's that's something that is very much on our mind at the moment. Maybe a quick word, and I'm sure Bill will, will talk more about it. Um, we take the implementation of the Colonna report extremely seriously. There is an action plan that is adopted by the agencies, supported by a range of donors financially. It has a number of key priorities that we work on every day. That includes strengthening the internal oversight mechanisms, ethics, investigations, um, action points on neutrality uh, violations when it comes to uh, personnel, when it comes to installations. Um, a review of the curriculum, and these things, they, they take their time, but we take them very seriously. And what I can tell you is that the, the system that we have in place to ensure the neutrality of staff and installation is, is, is a solid one. It's a solid one. Um, for example, I have protection neutrality teams that go out on a daily basis to check the, uh, the nature of our installation in the West Bank. Is there any problematic graffiti, problematic... Uh, uh, flyers, uh, any allegations about the behavior of staff. And that is not new, by the way. That is not new, by the way. Um, what I would also like to underline that in the West Bank, um, we have, particularly in this humanitarian crisis in the North, a relatively well-functioning civil military coordination structure with the IDF still. And that's something that allows us to facilitate humanitarian access, evacuate schools at times of hostility, and also make sure that, for example, we can quickly reopen installations after these, these operations that, as I said, take a very heavy toll on the population. And my last word, perhaps, on, on some of the allegations in Lebanon, actually two last words. Um, we've, we've, we've seen reports recently about a UN staff member who was killed and uh, who was announced by Hamas as uh, part of, of the leadership structure in, in Lebanon. That staff member, precisely because of those suspicions, was put on administrative leave um, without pay in uh, in February already. And the investigation has been ongoing since. And there are some narratives that say that the staff member was reinstated. That is not correct. That staff member remains on administrative leave. And we take these allegations very seriously. At the same time, it's also true that UNOMA does not have uh, an intelligence body that can essentially vet every single staff member. That's why these, sometimes, these things sometimes take a bit of time. And quite honestly, you know, uh, the scope of, of what was said by Hamas after the person was killed and what basically uh, the investigation was tracking is not congruent. So the things that were known now in all the in all the uh, in all these details that are being laid out, these are not things that were knowledgeable to the agency with that detail, even on the investigation. So just to say, this is not something easy, but we take it very, very seriously. And we're very concerned. And basically, people engaged in that activity betray the trust of the agency, of the UN, and also of the beneficiaries. The last point I want to say is that um, the fact that, 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 that at the moment we do not, have, have, uh, do not benefit from, from the support of the United States financially, of course, has an impact on our ability to deliver service. It's a big chunk of the budget. Um, and since UNOWA has a unified budget, um, it impacts the activities and operations everywhere. That means um, whatever money we don't have, it impacts Syria, it impacts Jordan, it impacts Lebanon, West Bank, and the Gaza Strip. So in that regard, um, I think it's, it's, it's important to understand that you cannot compartmentalize the agency's work due to its structure. And, and it's something that I think... Um, is useful to keep in mind while, while looking at, at the efforts to hopefully resume funding. Um, because we do know that a lot of particularly region hosts, meaning the governments of Jordan, um, Libya, uh, Lebanon, are of course very concerned about the impact of, of stability in their countries if UNOMA was unable to deliver its services going forward. I, I leave it at that and happy to provide a bit more detail later on as well. Thank you. Roland, thank you so much. That was a lot of valuable information in a short amount of time, and you did address my next question, which was on the escalations in Lebanon. So thank you for covering this scope of information.
providing us an overview of UNRWA's history and the current challenges it faces. Um, and next we'll hear from Bushra Khalidi, Palestinian policy lead at Oxfam. Bushra previously worked at Save the Children Palestine and as an advisor and legal researcher for the Office of the Quartet, focusing on water and governance policy. A qualified UK lawyer, Bushra has a background in constitutional law and providing legal support to vulner vulnerable children. Bushra, Bushra um, almost a year ago, you talked in our briefing on the humanitarian case for a ceasefire and provided us then with some crucial insights into the unlivable humanitarian conditions that were in Gaza, which have unfortunately only worsened since. So thank you so much for joining us again. Um, and I'd like to ask you first in regards to UNRWA's role in the humanitarian operations space, why is UNRWA considered the backbone of aid operations in Gaza? And how do organizations like Oxfam and others depend on their infrastructure? Thank you, and thank you for having me, and thank you to my colleagues on this panel as well for being here. It's really an honor, and also thank you to Rep. Uh, Carson and Demand Progress and uh, FCNL uh, for organizing this important event with us. Um, and yeah, uh, I want to also commend, and I think it's really important that we commend our colleagues at UNRWA and in my, you know, at Oxfam and other organizations here you know, delivering relentlessly on the ground and also, um, you know, mourning uh, our colleagues. We've lost over 289 colleagues over the last year. Um, and, it, you know, it's 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 been a very scary and risky times for people like us that operate in such a risky place um let you know and 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 being being targeted as well um relentlessly uh so i i also send my wishes to my colleagues in gaza and also all across the west bank and, and lebanon during those really really dark and difficult days um and in gaza unfortunately it's very sad i i i can't believe that it's been a year that um i was here uh speaking about the same issues uh and the humanitarian situation like you said um has just deteriorated Rated to absolutely catastrophic levels. It's what people and my colleagues describe the worst humanitarian situation they have ever, a uh, man-made humanitarian catastrophe that they've ever had to work in. Um, Israel's military onslaught that's compounded by the longstanding blockade. And it's very important to say that, you know, Gaza has been under a uh, 17 year siege uh, where it's uh, Israel has controlled what enters and what exits Gaza, whether it's food or people or materials. And Israel has over the last year systematically destroyed civilian infrastructure and made access to even the most basic of services, food, water, and healthcare, like nearly impossible. And UNRWA is the only entity with the scale and the reach necessary to meet these needs, especially at such a urgent situation. Um, and without them, uh, truly organizations like Oxfam could not be able to deliver uh, the life-saving aid that millions depend on. We're over, you know, 130 international organizations that operate in the occupied Palestinian territory. And um, I wanted to give you examples from multiple organizations as to how we operate through UNRWA. Uh, we're not separate entities. We form part of the same uh, operating community. Um, and it's really important to understand how our work uh, it, we need UNRWA infrastructure and assets and capacities to be able to, for example, provide safe spaces for children who are traumatized in their shelters. INGOs like, for example, Save the Children and Oxfam, we run psychosocial support programs within these shelters, um, helping children you know, process or process as much as the trauma that we can from the airstrikes, from the forcible displacement, um, from the daily violence they're seeing and witnessing and experiencing. UNRWA's infrastructure provides, you know, a, a, some sort of, I don't want to say stable because that's <laughs> overestimating it, but some sort of environment where these children can at least temporarily recover. Um, and without UNRWA's network of schools, um, this work would not have been possible. Uh, like Roland uh, said, these schools serve so over 300,000 children and many of whom now, now asking for more needs and, and access to more of their schooling facilities. But um, uh, under the current, um, uh, uh, unfortunately, under the current circumstances, uh, there's been very little access to educational materials, but it's still UNRWA that will fill that gap. Um, 
And so to ensure that children can continue some sort of learning. Um, as Oxfam, we are very much uh, uh, involved in the water and sanitation sector, which is a critical area really where uh, for Gaza, but where UNRWA's role as well cannot be overstated. Um, Gaza's water infrastructure has been absolutely decimated. And um, I, I urge you to read our latest report on water war crimes um, uh, committed in Gaza. Uh, but due to the years of bombardment with the majority of the population now lacking access to clean water, UNRWA is a, a, ma a major provi provider, actually, of water and sanitation services to hundreds of thousands uh, of uh, Palestinian refugees and, and internally displaced Palestinians. Um, Oxfam, for example, and ACF, um, Action Against Hunger, uh, work closely with, UNR with UNRWA to extend um, water infrastructure projects. For example, uh, we provided water trucking and repairs to sanitation facilities in refugee camps, um, while, for example, Action Against Hunger complemented UNRWA's work by leading uh, hygiene awareness campaigns to prevent disease outbreaks because of UNRWA's reach and infrastructure. Um, the blockade uh, and the siege on Gaza has, as you probably are aware, and I urge you to see the joint uh, humanitarian access snapshot that the uh, international organization put out every month on the restrictions on uh, uh, on materials, on the obstruction of aid um, that is needed, for example, to maintain and repair Gaza's water systems. But without UNRWA's infrastructure and coordination, Ox, like organizations like ours, we would struggle to keep this water flowing to the most vulnerable um, in Gaza. Um, it is through UNRWA's quick mobilizations that we're able uh, and supported through INGOs and our different platforms that we're able to restore some sort of uh, water access and distribute, for example, hygiene kits. Again, on healthcare and medical services, MSF and CARE, they work alongside UNRWA to provide healthcare services to their populations as well. Um, and we could only do that because of UNRWA's established healthcare infrastructure across the territory. MSF, for example, set up uh, specialized trauma clinics, um, and these are often ho hosted in UNRWA-run facilities uh, because of their trusted presence within the refugee population and, and also their close ties to the community, um, which you know uh, allows us to have better trust between uh, us and the communities that we serve. Um, same thing, CARE, for example, works with UNRWA to provide maternal health and child nutrition services uh, in Gaza. Uh, I, I mean, Roland touched upon the emergency shelters and the relief distribution in those shelters, um, but they, they have been essential uh, for displaced family to find some sort of refuge. Um, and uh, that's where also organizations like CARE and WFP and uh, Oxfam have been able to deliver parcels of food, for example. Um, <laughs> Also on advocacy and legal aid, UNRWA works with organizations um, like Oxfam and NRC on advocacy initiatives, uh, defending the rights of Palestinian refugees. Um, uh, and so we, NRC, for example, also provides legal aid services through some of UNRWA's uh, registered refugees to help them navigate the oppressive legal systems that often leaves them entirely vulnerable or forced to, dis to be displaced. Um, again, there's also cash for work programs, NRC, Oxfam, and um, UNRWA, for example, implement uh, cash for work programs across the, the, the Palestinian territory. But it's not just in Gaza. Uh, UNRWA collaborates with INGOs like ACF as well to ensure clean water here and sanitations in refugee camps all across where I am here in the West Bank. Um, uh, same thing uh, with MSF uh, and medical aid for Palestinians. UNRWA delivers mental health and psychosocial report support to students uh, in UNRWA schools who, for example, faced trauma from the daily violence uh, going to and from schools. Uh, we are looking at record numbers of attacks on education uh, in the West Bank, for example, in the last year. Uh, you know, UNRWA schools provide some sort of safe haven to these children. But UNRWA's importance, it extends beyond Gaza. Um, and we can talk about it later. And I'd love to talk about the work that we do in Lebanon as well with UNRWA. Um, but the, the, here's the reality. Under resourcing UNRWA at this moment, I mean, I can't imagine, I mean, every day I wake up not imagining that this day could be worse, but every day has been worse for the last year, uh, especially even today. Um, and I cannot imagine how much more catastrophic the situation in Gaza could become. Uh, the winter is coming and people are literally sprawled on a beach. Uh, with sand, with very little access to services. Um, uh, if we cut UNRWA off 
we will cut families from access to some sort of healthcare, some sort of clean water, some sort of food. Um, and, and the same thing for the region. And what happens in Gaza, it doesn't stay in Gaza. And we've seen this with the escalation in Lebanon. It's a direct result of the broader regional instability and the fact that we've, uh, you know, the international community has been unable to enforce a ceasefire. Um, and, and, and it's UNRWA's ability that to at least to provide some sort of stability to these comp communities. If a ceasefire does not happen, this will be entirely compromised. Um, and 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 will prevent, you know, will, will, uh, even I would say, I would go as far as saying that UNRWA ha plays a very important role in preventing further destabilization in Lebanon and elsewhere. Um, UNRWA, like Roland said it, and I will say it again, is the backbone of aid operations in Gaza and across the region. Uh, and organizations like ours and Save the Children and MSF and CARE and all, all of these big agencies, including WFP, we depend on UNRWA's infrastructure to deliver life-saving services in the, in the most challenging of environment. And weakening UNRWA now will just lead to more suffering and to more killing and to more displacement and to more violence. Um, and, and so we must restore full fund funding to UNRWA. It should not be a question at this stage and one year in. Um, and finally, I just want to put just one last point. You know, Oxfam and organizations like those I've mentioned, we've been here for decades. We know this place. We have been operating here um, and within these challenges for years. Um, and we know how to navigate um, this, this context. And it's an extremely complex context. Um, and, and finally, uh, we, we, we cannot uh, bypass the existing systems and these existing forms that we have worked so hard to get to, where if it wasn't for UNOWA, there would be no aid delivery in Gaza. Um, and so if it wasn't for us being here for years, knowing the communities and working within the communities, our staff are the communities that we serve. Um, we wouldn't be allowed to, 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 we wouldn't be able to do anything in Gaza at this stage. Uh, so, and that's why it's just so much more important to not only fund and continue funding UNRWA, but empower it and empower all of the UN agencies forming part of the humanitarian country team. It's not the time to fragment the humanitarian uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, community here. It's, it's, it's the time to empower them uh, with full resources and full capacities. And thank you. Bushra, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate uh, your insights here. And if you could briefly speak to any Oxfam UNRWA collaboration right now in Lebanon as these hostilities unfold. So, of course, we're still, you know, in, in very early days uh, in terms of responding in Lebanon and assessing the situations. But um, like I said, UNRWA's importance extends beyond Gaza. Uh, for example, the previous uh, escalations and violence in the Ain al Helwi camps, the refugee camps in Lebanon that displaced uh, Palestinian refugees at the time. Um, uh, we worked uh, with UNRWA in order to work with these um, uh, uh, it, within the with, with, within the camps. Sorry. So we had to use UNRWA's kind of relations and understanding of the community to be able to operate and respond in the camps. For example, there was a cholera outbreak in Lebanon at one point, and Oxfam worked closely in UNRWA to deliver sanitation and hygiene supplies to Palestinian refugees in the camps. Um, uh, again, we provided emergency shelters for displaced people, um, uh, while, for example, Oxfam at the same time was uh, delivering food. So we had direct coordination with UNRWA in Lebanon in the refugee camps. Um, and and for from what we hear from our, our colleagues in Lebanon, their presence is the difference between chaos and coordinated relief um, because they provide the infrastructure that allows us NGOs that are much smaller to operate in a you know highly volatile uh, environment. So again, uh, in Lebanon, um, the escalation of violence will worsen, um, uh, displacing even more people and pushing already vulnerable communities to the breaking point. Uh, again, it's not the time to now weaken UNRWA. The, the time Time now is to empower it and empower all of the UN agencies. Appreciate appreciate your answer so much. Uh, thank you for shedding light on UNRWA's role in Gaza and the region and its cooperation with organizations like your own. Um, and next, we'll hear from Bill Deere, director of the Washington D.C. office of UNRWA. Bill has worn many hats throughout his career, having served both in the executive and legislative branches of the U.S. government 
and as a senior executive at major business trade and membership organizations. Bill served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Senate Affairs at the U.S. Department of State under Colin Powell. In the legislative branch, Deer served as an associate staff member to the House Committee on Foreign Operations, overseeing the advancement of appropriations priorities at the Foreign Operations Appropriations Subcommittee. So, Bill, I have a packed question for you that I trust you'll be able to answer the best which is um, if you could please walk us through the current state of play on the Hill and administration in regards to UNRWA funding and policy, and specifically what the UNRWA Funding Emergency Restoration Act does. Additionally, could you also tell us about the appropriations process here and what opportunities for UNRWA funding can be deliberated again in Congress? Well, Adelia, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation um, and thanks for the folks uh, joining uh, uh, I have to say, um, at the beginning, wore many hats is an artful way because uh, when you read my bio, it sounds like I can't hold a job. So um, I, I think to understand all this, we we need to, to I need to cover two points here uh, at the very beginning before we go in the plunge into the appropriations process and the under a restoration act. First, uh, the commissioner general has discussed uh, countless times now, uh, there is a global disinformation campaign that is underway that is uh, intent on um, terminating the existence of the agency. Now, the, the goal has really nothing in particular to do with what the agency does or how we do it. The real goal is to, uh, the, the theory is that if you take UNRWA off the board, you take away the issue of the final status of Palestine refugees. Uh, I can tell you from a legal perspective, that is absolutely not the case. But uh, as you uh, noted from my resume, I have been around the block a little bit, and this is by far the most thorough, well-financed, well-thought-out disinformation campaign I've ever experienced. Um, that makes the difficult policy environment on Capitol Hill even more difficult. Um, and, I, and I just have to say, I am a very proud House alum, uh, it, but I, I don't envy those of you, uh, you know, on this, uh, uh, you know, viewing this today who work on the Hill. It's a difficult policy environment now. Folks are locked into their own points. There's no, often no due diligence. Uh, and, and it's not just about the Middle East. It's not just about UNRWA. You, you, you. The Hill staff on this call know it's across virtually every issue. So thank you for what you do, because I can tell you, um, you're doing it under the most difficult conditions that uh, I have ever seen. Now, directly to your question, um, the current law states that uh, there is a pause on funding to UNRWA until March of 2025. The issue um, that will come to the forefront in the upcoming lame duck session of Congress will be whether or not um, that pause is extended all the way through the fiscal year. So say from, I, I believe, at the end of March of 25, all the way through September 30th of 2025, the end of the fiscal year. So the Unrest uh, Restoration Act um, and, and uh, you know, huge thanks, uh, you know, as you know, uh, colleagues, it's a little lonely at the lunch table for UNRWA these days as a result of this global campaign. Uh, so, express, you know, it's not for the UN to um, legislate or give suggestions to legislators about how to do their job. Um, but it is very heartening to see the response um, of so many members to co-sponsoring this UNRWA Restoration Act. Uh, the act uh, and the letter to President Biden from over 100 civil society actors uh, is, and this is my opinion, is asking the question, uh, 16 nations paused their support to UNRWA, 15 have returned. It's time for the United States to join those 15 nations. And, you know, it's... Uh, you know, a, a bill like this is going to have a rough ride in a, a you know, in the current uh, House, but it serves as a very important 
uh, sign of support for the agency, just like the letter to the president said, it's time for you, Mr. President, and your administration to re-engage with Congress, uh, you know, in support of UNRWA. Bill, you finish. Um, yeah, I, I did want to ask another question as well, which is if you could provide us an update on the UN independent investigation and what steps UNRWA has taken to follow its recommendations. Sure, sure. So um, again, this requires a little bit of setup um, and it goes right back to uh, what I talked about, the, uh, the uh, current uh, global campaign against the agency. Uh, in fact, I, I the idea for an independent outside review of the agency actually started with Commissioner General Lazzarini. Uh, and I remember it uh, because he literally called me and said, Bill, I'm going to save you from getting up at two in the morning for a meeting. Um, I understand the issue, which is detractors say one thing, UNRWA says something else, and it's become virtually impossible for policymakers to sort through and get to the, you know, get to the real facts. He said, so I think that um, what we need to do here is to get an independent outside review of the agency's neutrality operation. And uh, proving uh, Odilia that everybody has a boss, the secretary general said that was a great idea and took it over. And he named uh, French foreign minister Catherine Colonna to uh, lead the uh, uh, independent outside review. And that's why when my colleague uh, Roland mentioned the Kelowna report, that is uh, the shorthand that is used to describe the independent outside review of UNRWA that was led by former French Foreign Minister Kelowna. Now, what it said was a couple of things. Uh, the detractors, uh, a lot of folks ignored the fact that Foreign Minister Kelowna's conclusion was that UNRWA does, in fact, a great deal more in the neutrality space and in the, uh, and how it addresses neutrality issues with its employees than most uh, NGOs and international organizations. But, uh, you know, Catherine Colonna also said, hey, you can always do better and provided 50 recommendations for how we could improve something that is candidly already on the cutting edge. UNRWA immediately embraced all 50 recommendations. The recommend the implementation of the recommendations is being led by Deputy Commissioner General Antonia DeMeo, an American. And the plan is, what we're doing is we're taking the 50 recommendations and essentially putting them in three baskets. Uh, as you can imagine, what you'd want to do is first the low-hanging fruit. What are the things that you can do quickly and without money? The second group is what, what needs midterm, what needs to be thought through a little more. Uh, and finally, the long term. Some think recommendations will have to take longer than others. And candidly, just so we all understand each other here, some of these recommendations take money. Uh, and you, you uh, so it's going to be uh, uh, both the, the, member states and the agency have to work together to implement these recommendations. Otherwise, they're not going to be as effective as Foreign Minister Colonna hopes they will. Really appreciate that answer. Thank you. And now we'll be um, moving to the Q&A section and, and address questions asked by staffers prior to the briefing today. So kind of on that point, Bill, I want to open this question up to Roland as well. What are the concrete predicted consequences of a failure of Congress and the administration to restore funding to UNRWA in March of 2025? Roland, would you like to start us off? Bill, actually, it looks like you had something. Yeah, let me, let's just talk, uh, before I turn it over to Roland, who has frankly forgotten more about this stuff than I'll ever know, uh, because uh, field directors like Roland are the backbone of this backbone operation. He's the one that makes the education happen. He's the one who makes the healthcare system run, the social services. But uh, for a Hill context, in 2023, the United States provided $422 million to the agency across various platforms. For 2024, that was reduced to $78 million. 
So we have, you know, the United States uh, in 2023 and for many years before was the agency's largest donor. So it starts with a, a huge hole that has to be filled with the absence of the United States. Now we don't even have the 78 million that we received in 2024. Layered on top of that, and, and Roland can talk to this too, is the fact that uh, worldwide humanitarian assistance levels writ large are dropping. So the pie is not getting bigger, it's getting smaller. So that's just going to exacerbate uh, our problems in 2025. And I'll hush up now and let the real expert talk. Yes, go ahead. Well, um, thanks a lot. Let me try maybe to amplify a bit sort of on, 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 on Bill's excellent points. I mean, as I said earlier, um, having sort of 30% or, or more of the core budget not available has an impact on all of our operations in all five um, countries, in all five field operations, Gaza, West Bank, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon. Um, and it means basically that our ability to deliver the key services will be heavily compromised. Um, just to give you some more figures, um, we talked already about Gaza, normally 250,000 kids in school, that's a different situation. Now, the West Bank, we now have an increase um, from 45,000 to 47,000 school kids because of the economic situation of the West Bank. In Jordan, 116 schools with another, another 114,000 kids in school. Syria, uh, 102 schools, 50,000 kids in school. So the schools alone have already been running on a shoestring and having not enough money to deliver the core services will force us to make painful decisions and reduce services. And that can then have an immediate impact on our ability to, to make sure that kids get a good education um, in an increasingly difficult socioeconomic context. And clearly in places like Lebanon and the West Bank and also the Gaza Strip, um, you would be not losing a generation that does not benefit from, from education, but also that is, is, is very easy to, to, to you know, be a pool of recruits for all kinds of nefarious actors, terrorist groups, and it's clearly something that we see in the West Bank. There are basically actors going around distributing money to young people, very young people, by the way, 16, 17, 18 years old, are refugees and non-refugees to take up weapons and conduct attacks. Um, and the more people you have not being in school, but out on the street, the bigger the, the, the reservoir, the pool is for those actors to recruit, recruit those kids. So I think that's something, it's, it's a very realistic uh, argument, but it's, it's the reality. Um, when it comes to the humanitarian operation as such, you know, we have two funding uh, uh, streams. One is, is of course, the, what we call the program budget, that's the core budget. And then we have um, funding um, appeals, humanitarian appeals, flash appeals, specifically for the delivery of direct humanitarian assistance. But the platform costs of all of that, um, salaries of staff, logistics, fuel, and so on and so forth, including Gaza, is coming from the general budget of UNOWA. So if that is not adequately funded, you don't have the platform covered, you can also not extend all the direct humanitarian assistance that is coming from different funding streams. So that is, I think, something important to, to keep in mind. Um, and, and when you look at the uh, situation in Gaza Strip, I mean, it's not just the refugee children, more than 600,000 kids out of school that have not had a, a single day of proper school since the 7th of October in the Gaza Strip. This will become, as I said earlier, clearly lost generation if more urgent action is taken. UNOWA has now taken steps to start some limited learning activities in the Gaza Strip in the shelters where it's possible. It means a couple of hours a day, mostly recreation, mental health and psychosocial support, bit of English, bit of math, um, to a very limited number of kids simply because the situation is so difficult. Um, we're talking about something below 30,000 out of those, those 600,000 kids overall who work closely with others. Um, but it's something that, uh, that is very difficult to deliver. And just to give you another comparison, um, we have roughly 5,000 of our uh, 14,000 staff in Gaza working still directly in the humanitarian response. Um, that means that a lot of them do not necessarily, except for the medical staff and the teaching and psychosocial health staff, a lot of them work in running shelters um, simply because, because they want to support and we only act on the ground. If you basically bring together all the other um, humanitarian actors on the ground in terms of the 
a workforce, you probably end up with a with a with a three digit number at the moment compared to uh, to one of five thousand staff engaged in human development operations. I think that's important to keep in mind in terms of scale and also scale because there's a lot of a lot of unrealistic. Um, sometimes naive thinking that other agencies could simply step in and take over from one of them. I mean, no UN agency does direct service delivery. Of course, we don't want, do not want to do that forever. That's a mandate we've been given. And if there's a political solution and one of them can hand over to a Palestinian entity or in fact a Palestinian state in the future, that's what we will be, do, will be doing with a lot of pleasure. But the, um, the, uh, the idea that you simply you know, split up the mandate and WFP does then uh, all the food and then somebody else runs the schools. The mandates of these other agencies are completely different and they cannot be easily changed. Um, and the mandate that we have been given by the General Assembly is very specific on this. Um, and then, of course, the scale of the operation, again, talk particularly about Gaza here, is, it's, it's, in my view, uh, completely unrealistic that other actors sort of can shoulder what UNOMA is doing there at the moment now, of course, also things that UNOVA in the early recovery would not be doing, where others are better positioned. So we want to stay true to our core mandate. But simply the scale of the challenges there make it very difficult to see that anybody else could pick this up. Um, and uh, and I think it's something important to, to keep in mind because there's so much discussion now about the early recovery process and the future of the Gaza Strip and the governance arrangements and all of that. Um, a lot of hard questions there, and in that regard, UNOWA is ready and, and wants to be part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Appreciate it. Um, we do have a question from a staffer. If uh, Bill, I think this one is for you. If you could please clarify the process of how this bill now and if it is presumably reintroduced next year. Um, the approbes process related to this in lifting the prohibition on UNRWA funding by the U.S. Just a bit uh, clarifying. Sure. And and th actually, uh, to whichever staffer asked, thank you, because I, I gave it short shrift, and that's not fair to uh, the tremendous work of Representatives Carson, Jayapal, and Schakowsky. Uh, the bill uh, does a couple things, uh, at least my reading of it, which is that uh, recall I discussed the fact that current law states that uh, there's a pause on U.S. funding uh, until, uh, I think it's March 26th of 2025. Uh, the bill re uh, strikes that provision, repeals it. Uh, the bill encourages the administration to uh, re-engage with UNRWA. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and I suspect we'll talk about this later. Uh, the bill also uh, ties into the independent uh, review that you referenced in another question, Adelia, where it says, give us quarterly reports on how the uh, uh, administration give give Congress, you know, quarterly reports, I believe it's quarterly reports on uh, how UNRWA is doing in implementing the recommendations of the Kelowna report. Thank you for that. Yeah, it is a quarterly report built into the bill to ensure accountability continues. Right, and rightly so. I mean, uh, this is uh, this is taxpayer money, and uh, I, it's quite reasonable of members of Congress to want to make sure that their taxpayer money is being utilized in the manner that uh, that they want it to be. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this has really been a great discussion. And thank you all for sharing your timely insights. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left, so I'd like to ask each panelist to share 60-second uh, closing words. Let's hear first from Bushra. I mean, I can't speak um, as eloquently on, you know, direct UNRWA operations um, uh, as much as my colleagues can. Uh, and I'm also on the policy side of things rather than on the programmatic, on the ground level. Uh, but what I can say is that there's a long history of uh, work and partnership uh, with UNRWA. And um, it, it is not just also the protection of the humanitarian situation. Please remember that UNRWA was also operating before the 7th of October. And UNRWA was also facing much backlash for many years uh, by Israel. It's not 
a, a very new phenomenon. This is something that we as international organizations, but also grassroots organizations have been facing um, uh, in terms of a shrinking space, a shrinking operating space, but also just a shrinking general space where we're unable to get permits or visas to enter, where our aid is obstructed in, in so many different ways. Um, funding is slashed here and there. There were organization, Palestinian organizations that would name terror groups uh, three years ago where, and I think we need to remember the lessons um, from from before. Uh, in in 2021, there were six uh, Palestinian local organizations that were designed as terror groups by Israel through military orders. And we, we ran a big campaign because many of UN agencies and uh, international organizations were funding these organizations. So we had our own liabilities. Um, if we continued to kind of work with these organizations, we, we went on a we, we really ran a very thorough public campaign, um, standing with the six at the time, um, and 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 funding was restored and evidence and the allegations um, that the Israelis had at the time put forward were never found to be true by any member state. And so I think like this is also a lesson learned. Um, and we, we need to, to learn from the lessons of the past. Again, we've been operating here for decades. We know this place, we know how to operate it. We know how to work within these constraints to the best of our abilities and as much as we can do. Um, but, uh, and, and so, you know, there needs to be that trust and also, you know, slashing an organization like UNRWA or any other UN agency I mean, the, the immense impact this would have on the trust that we have with communities. And I, I, I've said that before, but I think I just want to underscore it again. Um, the fact that the reason why we're able to operate is because we know the communities. We form part of these communities. We are asked by donors to um, have a localization agenda, um, including you know uh, donors in the US. And localizing means you working with your own communities and empowering your communities to deliver the aid to their own communities. Um, and that is what UNRWA does organically. Um, so, uh, so and 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 so removing that uh, kind of idea is removing the idea of working with local with with through the communities. So why would communities in Palestine or Palestinian communities across the region trust anybody else other than these organizations that have been here and delivering and have stood by? And have not shut down their operations and have not left and, and remain committed to delivering aid, you know, no matter what. Appreciate it, Bushra. Thank you. Uh, Bill, please, uh, a couple of closing words. Certainly. Um, I, I just want to reiterate to folks th this this global misinformation campaign um, makes uh, it, it makes things for folks up on the hill. And like I said, I'm a proud alum very difficult. So if you hear something odd about UNRWA, just reach out to myself or my uh, colleague, uh, Caitlin Bell, and we will get you the answer. And I'll just close just by a brief example of that is the latest kerfuffle over uh, an employee of UNRWA uh, who is now, uh, that we had uh, suspended without pay and we're in the process of investigating up in Lebanon. Um, in fact, it is not a story of UNRWA um, incompetence or UNRWA unwillingness to take on uh, bad actors in its organization. It's quite the opposite. Uh, what happened was UNRWA uh, was investigating uh, and, and taking action swiftly, decisively, and at personal risk, uh, as there were threats, including death threats, uh, placed upon our uh, on our staff. Our facilities were blocked by protesters for months. So in other words, uh, you know, the, the the first blush of detractors often turns out to be quite the opposite. So if you have a question, that's just reach out to myself or my colleague, Caitlin Bell. That's what we're here for. So thank you again for the opportunity today. Thank you so much, Bill. And uh, Roland, please go ahead. I mean, Uno is, is not perfect. Uh, like any organization, we have we have space to grow, to learn, and we're fully committed to implementing the Kelowna Action Plan and being held accountable against that. Um, simply because we are committed to delivering on the mandate, and it's our duty to do the best we can to support the beneficiaries that we serve. Secondly, UNRWA is 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 not the enemy of the state of Israel. The opposite. 
Israel is part of the United Nations. UNRWA is committed to be part of a political solution. And we're there to be an actor to be trusted. We have our homework to do. Um, however, some of the recent, and I mentioned it, efforts um, to, to slay the organization or undermine its ability to deliver through introducing legislation, uh, designating UNRWA international and national personnel as terrorists, that is simply, is simply extremely concerning. And the impacts of that, if it were to be approved, goes way beyond Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. It has a direct impact on the UN's ability overall to deliver globally. And then finally, um, we need your continued support um, politically, financially, to be able to, to, to do what we can in the extremely difficult circumstance in the Gaza Strip with very little hope um, for a ceasefire in the, in, the, in the near future, but also to maintain our ability to continue what we do in the West Bank, now increasing in Lebanon on the humanitarian side, and more broadly, so that people here, our beneficiaries, they have a future, they have something to strive and live towards too, but also um, ensuring that, that the political complexity of the regions uh, here are not impacted by further deterioration of the situation of our beneficiaries who themselves will be suffering from. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again um, to all of our panelists for coming to speak with us, especially considering the time differences. Um, and thank you all to the people who came and were the audience for this briefing. So much for coming. Uh, keep an eye out for a follow up email with a recording of this briefing and invites to future events in this series. If you have any follow up questions that were unanswered by panelists, want to reach out to the panelists who spoke today personally, if possible, please email kavan at demandprogress.org. That is C A V A N at demandprogress.org. We appreciate you all showing up and have a good rest of your day.